The opposite. A, a technical note: uh, the, hand, the handout is not particularly helpful. It doesn't have an English translation, but I just underlined some key words like DK, Mira, as we're going to see, uh, that we run through the paper. So, uh, the horrible history of the House of Atreus uh, is dramatized in well-known tragedies by Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, apart from others. These dramas represent the vengeance that Orestes and Electra take on their mother Clytemnestra and her lover Aegisthus, and accomplice, for the murder of their father Agamemnon after his return from the Trojan War. <coughs> Clytemnestra's reported principal motive is Agamemnon's decision to sacrifice their daughter Iphigenia to the gods so that the Aegean fleet could sail to Troy, so for the sake of the world. So, although in all treatments that we're going to see today, Agamemnon's slaying is largely presented as an act of retributive justice, covered by the term decay, as is Clytemnestra's own death, there are telling differences in the way in which decay is approached. Ischylus or Estaya, as we heard before, covers the entire story, uh, from Iphigenia's sacrifice, pre-war, to uh, Orestes' acquittal, which assumes a broader significance, as we'll see. In the first place of the trilogy, Agamemnon and Libation Bearers, or Koifori, uh, the conflicting parties do not engage in real debates uh, about the justifications of their causes, nor do they elaborate on the possible complications of the principle of retaliation, returning like for like, roughly. Dike, with a capital D, is largely evoked as a personified abstraction, as a goddess, especially in the choral odes. So she's the stern daughter of Zeus, who will sooner or later punish their own doers through her human agents, and who is closely associated with other divinities, especially the Furies, Erinias, and the Fates, the Moirai, the Mire, uh, as you can see some examples in handout number one. At the same time, though, the plays, the first two plays of the trilogy, occasionally cast acts of retributions in metaphors of the courts, reinforcing the two basic senses of Dike, the retributive and the legal. With respect to Agamemnon's killing, which is the central dramatic act of the first play, Agamemnon, the eponymous play, Clytemnestra and her accomplice Aegisthus, who have their separate reasons to think that they have been seriously wronged by the king, by Agamemnon, triumphantly consider that justice has been served, as we can see in handout number two. Appealing to the dike exacted for her daughter, Clytemnestra views the killing of her husband as the work of a just craftsman, whilst also perceiving herself as the agent of the house's inherited curse, the demon or the alastor, which dates back to Thiestes and Holy Feast. So we have another factor there. Aegisthus, likewise, Thiest's son, welcomes the light of the day of retribution, Dike Foros, now that he beholds Agamemnon, in his words, injustices net, a common metaphor. The chorus of Argive elders, on the other hand, who feel that the defiant, tyrannical couple, Clytemnestra and Aegisthus, is literally polluting justice, Dike, warn Aegisthus that Dike will not let him escape death by stoning, as we saw, at the people's hand, handout number three. In Libation Bearers, indeed, the second play of the trilogy, we do not see the stoning, but uh, the siblings and the chorus of foreign slave women 
all identify the slang of the couple with the arrival of Dickens. Even more so, since they are confident that it is sanctioned by Apollo, this development, who has never been false. <coughs> Already at the outset, the chorus urges the resentful yet hesitant Electra to pray that a god or a man might show up who would, who would repay her enemies with ills. Electra's question of whether this man or god, this agent, should appear as a judge, Dicastes, or as an avenger, Dikephoros, is seen as superfluous. This man or god, according to the chorus, should simply kill the perpetrators. And no doubt, pious prayer, as they say. Indeed, the siblings subsequently pray to the gods and to the dead Agamemnon himself, urging him to send the victorious Dike to battle as an ally. One Clytemnestra begs for mercy, claiming that fate, Moira, as we say, must share the blame uh, for Agamemnon's death, Orestes responds that it is precisely fate who is going to kill her, or that she will actually kill herself. The hero, in the end, calls upon the son, who sees everything as Dike, to witness that he has justly repaid his mother for her impure acts and for her shameless and unjust disposition, while the adulterer Registhus is said to have been punished according to the relevant law. Nothing more. Handout number four. As Orestes is chased by the Furies for something bad was going to come up, the chorus wonder when the fury of calamity will end. Humanides, the final play of the trilogy, treats Orestes' individual case in the light of a broader scheme of things. More is at stake than one man, in the words of the Furies, therein is the course of the play. Orestes' idiosyncratic trial, witnessed by all Athenian citizens, is supposed to set the precedent for how cases of murder will be regulated and justice is to be dispensed, in that regard, through the Ariopagus Tribunal for all time to come. The two basic senses of TK, the retributive and the legal, now get extensively and perplexingly intertwined. Dike as law court becomes a reality now, not just a metaphor as in the previous plays, but at the same time, DK is not confined to legal order, it extends to social order, to quote from Goldhill, to the right organization of all the parts and relations of the city. The major class of the play is between the Furies and Apollo, who testifies on Orestes' behalf, so to divine powers. The god, Apollo, straight away asserts that he will speak justly Dikeos before the court, since he cannot lie by virtue of his status as a prophet. And this reinforces the common connection in literature of Dike with truth-telling and honesty. Apollo relies on the sanctity of marriage, which is guarded by the goddess Dike, in his words, and on his conviction that the only true parent is the father. To conclude, uh, the god, that Zeus practically authorized Clytemnestra's death, hence the Furies unjustly banished Orestes from his home. For the Furies, on the other hand, Orestes is definitely, definitely guiltier than his mother, because he killed someone of the same blood as himself. The deities, the Furies, set up a polarity between the old gods and laws and the younger gods who transgressed justice, in the words. In the frame of this distinction, they underline their kinship with the fates, as we saw, who always distribute just rewards, and with the goddess Dike, when identifying their possible defeat at the trial with the very demolition of Dickes' shrine, handout number five. Out of respect, the Furies turn over the decision of the charge to Athena, who presides over the trial, another god, after the latter, Athena, points out that the goddesses, the Furies, want to be called just rather than what justly, which again reinforces the common a uh, morally charged discrepancy between words and deeds, or between appearance and reality. Aside from casting the decisive vote in favor of Orestes, since the jurors are tied, Athena more crucially undertakes to integrate the Furies into Athenian life. She manages to soothe their age after guaranteeing that they will have their cult in the city, a new home and honors. This integration, to some extent, reflects and promotes Athena's theory of justice 
namely that injustice can be averted only through, through the citizens' respect, Sebas, paired with fear, Phobos, away from both tyranny and anarchy, handout number seven. So fear, in the words of Athena, has a pivotal role in preserving order and is a part of justice, <coughs> sorry, and hence should be a part of the city, fear itself. The Furies themselves had emphasized that men should be just and temperate willingly, striking a balance between anarchy and despotism. Eventually then, with the close of the trilogy, some sort of order is achieved, both on the mortal plane and in the field of divine hierarchy, without that meaning that we don't have open questions, necessarily. In Sophocles Electra now, which is the same myth, the identification of GK with retributive justice appears to be more straightforward in a sense, even though certain aspects of the siblings' disposition, Electra and Orestes, and way of carrying out their plan, particular way, may lend the play a morally ambiguous tone. For one thing, the consequences of matricide are not explored, nor is there any expression of hesitation or remorse on behalf of the siblings who dutifully follow Apollo's reported commands as an Aeschylus, handout number eight. A single objection is raised by Chrysophemes, another sister, only on the grounds of expediency, that is, of the possible harmful effects of one's commitment to the execution of justice, quite pragmatically, as in cases where it contradicts a higher human authority and you could get in trouble. By contrast with Aeschylus, the drama pays due attention to the character's individual motivation and particular take on Dike. In the agon between mother and daughter, the debate, the notions of justice, lawfulness, and dishonor are central and interconnected. Clytemnestra first attacked Electra on the grounds of the disgrace she is bringing upon her family by publicly calling her mother an arrogant and unjust Peradikes ruler. Her major point, however, is that the deity Diki herself had been assisting her in her killing of her husband because Agamemnon, alone of all the Greeks, had had the heart to sacrifice their daughter. Handout number nine. Clytemnestra, therefore, treats Dike as her accomplice, but she also emphasizes that it is to her, Moi, that Agamemnon paid the penalty. Eleva herself lays out a corresponding reasoning by first labeling Clytemnestra's admission that she killed her husband as most shameful, as Kayon, regardless of whether the killing was just. So at this point, she sets up the distinction between the deed itself and the perpetrator's way of publicly relating to the deed, leaving the factor of justice aside. The core of the heroine's argument, however, revolves around the quality of Dikeon, just, rather than around the quality of Iscron, dishonorable. Electra questions both her mother's employment of their blood for blood law as her real motive, instead she considers that her mother's motive was her infidelity, and only that, and seemingly the validity or soundness of this law itself, the blood for blood. For one thing, according to Electra, Agamemnon had been uh, constrained by divine necessity, hence he cannot be held accountable for his deed. But even if he had been a free agent, her mother would not be justified in seeking vengeance for herself, for there is no such law or custom, nomos. Even though Electra herself had earlier identified the lack of blood for blood penalty with the loss of reverence, Ephsebia, and shame, Idos, from humanity. In any case, Electra warns her mother that by laying down such a law for mortals, she may lay down trouble for herself, since she would be the first to die if she were to meet with justice, handout number 10. The siblings will indeed soon execute the blood for blood law, and it is nowhere clearly suggested that this, is all, that this will also work to their disadvantage, as was their case with their mother. In the Euripidean Electra and Ores, on the other hand, our final place, attention is shifted to the character's ambivalent attitude, to say the least, towards matricide, as well as towards Apollo's oracle, which is questioned or criticized to varying degrees. Even though both plays foreshadow the acquittal of Orestes with a most pious vote and Electra's happy marriage, a happy end, let's say, the plays end rather darkly, both of them, while the divine epiphanies supposed to resolve the crisis 
do not necessarily offer satisfactory answers to the major moral issues. If I might say so, they rather accentuate them further. Both plays explore two interesting ideas relating to the perception of Dicke and its social extensions. First, a just act or reasoning is not necessarily honorable. It may at the same time be perceived as shameful, as strong. Second, a just outcome might be the product of an unjust and not simply, and not simply disgraceful act. This discrepancy may arise from the special relationship between avenger and victim and or from the outcome's relation to established laws and its possible impact on the community. So we have some combination in the sense of deontological and consequential approaches here to dig in. In the argument between mother and daughter in Electra, Clytemnestra once more bases her defense on her daughter's unjust sacrifice and on, and on Agamemnon's insulting decision to bring home his concubine, Cassandra. She has spoken justly in the view of the chorus of Argive women, yet her dike, her justice, is shameful, since women of good sense should always yield to their husbands, no matter what. Handout number 11. Electra argues for the inevitability of her mother's death if one is to take up the latter's, her mother's, own interpretation of dike, the did for that, echoing the Sophoclean point, handout number 12. Even though Electra and the chorus rejoice at the news of Aegisthus' death, which they interpret as the work of the all-seeing DK, uh, the siblings express their great remorse after the killing of Tatilaitemnestra, immediately after. The chorus themselves, whilst repeatedly claiming that the matricide is just, are clearly shocked by the deed. The intervention of the Dioscuri is supposed to set things back in order. Castor declares that Orestes' act was not just, even though Clytemnestra's punishment was, handout number 13. The god nonetheless blames the matricide on Apollo's unwise words, as well as on fate, necessity, and an ancestral curse. At the same time, he moralizes that the gods come to the aid only of those who cherish piety, hosion, and justice, which seems to imply that Orestes is one of those men. For all the hopeful prophecies of Castor about the couple, the play closes with the siblings' bitter separation. In Orestes, finally, the play, which dramatizes the siblings' plight after the matricide, the act and its reception are further problematized and rhetorically challenged, as are family ties, collective decision-making, law, and human interpretations of divine will. In this dark drama, Euripides freely chooses mythic material, uh, a mythical variant, sorry, and adds to the mythic material. The half-repentant Orestes, tormented by the Furies, who are however reduced to phantoms of his deranged imagination, acknowledges that he is both unholy as a matricide, Hosios, and holy as his father's avenger. Similarly, Electra agrees with the chorus that the matricide was just, yet she remarks that it was not well done, kalos, honorable. The play presupposes the existence of public justice, Hence, the archives are expected to decide on the siblings' fate by vote. Against this background, Orestes and his kin, Menelaus and Tindarius, map out the controversy of familial obligations and of the value of law. Orestes puts forth a rather extreme interpretation, if I might say so, of the principle of reciprocity when unsuccessfully entreating Menelaus to support him before the assembly. Beginning from the admission Orestes, that he had done wrong when healing his mother, Adiko, he argues that Menelaus should do a little wrongdoing for his sake in return, since the whole Trojan War had itself been unjust, undertaken for the sake of the transgressor Helen. In his exchange with his grandfather, Tindarius, Orestes adopts a different standpoint and stresses that he justly killed his mother, Adiko, <coughs> for reasons that we have already seen in the other plays. The hero was forced to choose between the furies of his mother, who murdered her husband simply to avoid paying the penalty for her infidelity, and between the furies of his deeply wronged father, the only true parents, echoing Apollo's point in humanities. As in Euripides' Electra, Apollo's own sense of dike is put into question, though far more emphatically, handout number 14, with Orestes even claiming that the god should be found guilty of the crime and slain, since it was he who committed the transgression. A fresh point, however, is that Clytemnestra's punishment will have a deterrent function. Hence, the hero conferred a great service on all of Hellas by killing his mother. This is the single point in tragedy that I know of where the, we have this deterrent 
uh, idea, the idea of the deterrent function of punishment. This consequential approach is given another twist by Tantarius, who appears as the proponent of law. By daring to kill his own mother, who however deserved to die, Orestes became even more irreverent than her. More importantly, Orestes' failure to conform to fixed, well-designed laws, which regulate proper penalties for bloodshed, namely exile, would ultimately jeopardize society's survival by leading to an endless chain of killings, handout number 15. Menelos, in his turn, upholds that blind obedience even to law is servile, but this is another point. The majority of the archives are portrayed as an easily manipulated, violent mob, resembling an unquenchable fire, readily convinced by an aim fellow to kill the siblings by stoning, upon entire searching, and despite his former defense of time-honored, pious punitive institutions other than killing. Facing seemingly certain death, the siblings once more resort to murderous vengeance, planning to kill Helen and Hermione. A new bloodshed is prevented by the intervention of Apollo, who assumes full responsibility and undertakes to restore the siblings' relationship with their community. It seems that this is the only available, as well as rather forced answer, to perpetual succession of retaliatory acts. So, uh, by having mapped out these divergences, I don't necessarily mean to imply, to imply at least at this stage, that, that there is a concrete or consistent pattern of change or evolution. We cannot in any way uh, infer that by only testing this case. Rather, I hope I have highlighted some of the important nuances pertaining to the intricate notions of justice, revenge, rightfulness, and other key notions such as shame. <laughs>